tuned to Planet Vera Radio. I am Cindy Schwartz, and this is Patient Partners. And we are broadcast on 101.7 Real Radio FM. On Skype, I have with me my co-host, Jeannie Roller. She is talking to me from Indiana. Jeannie, you're doing okay today? Yes, I am. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're going to talk about patient rights today and patient bill of rights and maybe get a little bit into civil rights and kind of cross the boundaries. And so I don't want to you start, Jeannie, because this is a huge topic issue. Uh, what are patient rights? Why do we have them? Do we really have them? I mean, thousands of people that you and I have talked with and are also one of our partners, Misty Roberts, who has medical patient modesty at patientmodesty.org. She gets calls all the time, emails all the time saying, you know, all these horrific things that have happened to the person in surgery, at a surgery, prep, whatever. And it doesn't seem like we do have any rights. So why don't you start with this one, Jeannie? Well, I consider patient rights as being the right to autonomy and the right to dignity. Those areas cover just about everything else. Um, most hospitals will have what they call a patient bill of rights. Most of them will have certain generalized um, phrases on there, like to res- to personal privacy, you have the right to personal privacy. That one is usually not kept. To receive care in a safe setting, that one too is not kept. To be free of all forms of abuse or harassment, that one also is broke. These patient bill rights are actually implied contracts, meaning that they state all these things that they guarantee for you during your care there. However, they don't keep up their end of the bargain. So why isn't anything ever done with the breaking of these implied contracts? That, that, that is the question because just about every hospital will breach these areas. The one I'm looking at has probably about 30 to 40 different uh, phrases on there that they're using to tell you As a patient, you have the right to blah, blah, blah. And most of these, they do not keep. Mm -hmm. So so just for the listeners out there, both Jeannie Roller and I are not lawyers. We're not doctors. We're not medical people. But what we are is patients that have had these harms done to us for different procedures and then got involved to try to help ourselves fix it and for other people because we are just listening to stories over and over and over again. So we talk on Twitter, we talk on Facebook, we talk here on air about what we can do, how to educate ourselves going forward and not be, I don't want to say fall into the trap, but that's what it seems like it is because we're trusting all this stuff. I know in my instance, the hospital that I went to sent out two booklets that are patient information booklets. Well, I'm here to tell you that 95% of the stuff that were in those booklets Really, all it was was media and publicity, because what happened and came to fruition was not what was in that booklet at all. It was to sell me or any patient on going to that specific facility. And then when you get there, these rights and these things that they say are available really aren't. And you are left with a whole other ball of wax that you did not myself personally sign on for. If I knew what was going to happen to me, I would have bolted out of the place. And that's, too, also with the patient rights. I mean, mine, the first thing was um, the patient is going to have dignity, respect, and and absolutely not. I mean, that did not happen at all. And it's crazy how we have to go, we feel that we have to go to get care to doctors, and we do, and there are so many decent doctors and so many decent medical people that the other ones are just tearing the system down. Right. All you have to do is meet one bad one in the whole bunch, and then then it goes downhill from there. Because that one bad one, the others will protect that one. Yeah, we, we've tried to we've talked about that on other ten minute segments too on why that does happen. And but it seems hopefully nowadays a little bit more of the stories are coming out into the forefront. We've had them on these ten minute segments, different people talking about what happened to them and that they have gone to try to find the police, to find different organizations to get help, to get the story out there, to have something stopped and not have this happen to somebody else where they're just not going to take it any longer. 
So mm-hmm. on mine, when I Googled it. I just did a quick Google search because I knew, Jeannie, that you had the specific patient right one in front of you for, from a certain facility. Mine is just a general one. And apparently it started in 1998, and it says a summary of Consumer Bill of Rights which is and Responsibilities, which is the same, it says, as Patient Bill of Rights. So it says the Patient Bill of Rights was created to try to reach three major goals. One is to help patients feel more confident in the U.S. health care system, the Bill of Rights. Um, assures that the healthcare system is fair and it works to meet patient needs, gives patients a way to address any problems they may have, encourages patients to take an active role in staying and getting healthy. Okay. The second one, to stress the importance of a strong relationship between patients and their health care providers. And three, to stress the key role patients play in staying healthy. So you have to do your part. So I guess where we're stumbling over all of this is when we do do our part and we go in there, we do not get all of the information to make our actual informed consent and so that is part of the patient rights that you're supposed to be disclosed everything so you can make a legitimately educated as best you can decision on what you're going to do. Right. That informed consent isn't really informed. In fact, uh, the government allows them to decide what they actually want to inform you about. So if there's a particular part of your treatment that they have the feeling that you would reject, they just don't tell you about it. And that's okay. And so the reason we kind of say that is because a gentleman that uh, reached out to us who had surgery in, uh, I believe it was Iowa, and it was surgery on his lower leg, his lower calf, his whole groin was shaved. And he woke up and didn't even know that this was going, no one had ever told him that. And when they complained about it, they said, well, you know, it had to do with the hair pattern and blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, this was surgery on the bottom of my calf. So why is my groin involved? And they said, well, that's our procedure. Well, if they knew that, then they should have said that to him to begin with, because that's a shock to wake up to. Well, certainly when you don't expect, I mean, there's no reason that the normal person would expect that to happen. I mean, there's absolutely no reason for it to have happened. And and the answer that they gave them to him and me reading some of the reports and stuff or whatever, it, it doesn't seem to be medically necessary. Again, I'm not a doctor, but they didn't really give a specific medical reason. They just gave like a kind of abstract reason. And the guy feels, and rightfully so, sexually violated. Right, right. Because, I mean, that area should have been draped. So I don't, it doesn't make sense about a hair pattern a hair pattern how exactly right yeah well i think that was kind of what we all deduced from their from that particular facility's answer back to him and also too i mean while we've talked about this on other segments why can't you wear surgery specific undergarments which are sterile right i mean that would have stopped whatever that was right so patient rights i mean do we have them that's what we're trying to decide do we have them No, we do not. They're all on paper, and they look good, but they actually mean nothing. In fact, they do more harm than good because people read these and they think, oh, yeah, I'm protected. No, you're not. So they set you up, like I said, with the booklets that I received from my facility, they set you up for this cushy, like, mindset that everything's going to be okay, and then wham, bang, you get there, and it is not what you think it's going to be. And the other thing, too, that we've talked about before is how the drugs immediately go into you regardless of, you know, what side effects you have to them. I mean, that's the way so many people have said it to me that have been harmed. And once they do that, and I was told once you're under anesthesia, it doesn't matter. They do whatever they want. And that's what they, quote, said to me specifically. It does not matter. You are under anesthesia. So I don't see where patient rights really come to the forefront on any paper that I've read when that is their answer to, you know, like quell your investigation. Yeah, it, it is just lip service or paper service, I suppose, in this case. It is to make you feel protected, and then you're actually not. And, yes, drugs are used to control patients. Yeah. That's how to do it. Yeah, you know, we've seen, we saw a lot with the oxy with the oxy epidemic and whatever, and some of this with the fentanyl and these other things, too, is going to be just as serious. This is just my opinion, but... It's kind of crazy, but I'm glad we're talking about it and other people are talking about it. So uh, Misty Roberts is on Medical Patient Modesty on Facebook. She is also on PatientModesty.org. She is one of our partners. Jeannie, give your uh, Twitter handle. At Rights for Patients. 
And it's rights with a numeral four and then for patients. Right. Okay. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, you've been listening to another segment on Planet Vero Radio. This is Patient Partners. Stay tuned. 